there's a lot of interest in the whole fuel economy classic car thing the video we did last week about the smoky hot vapor engine and all created a lot of response or a lot of comments and before I get into what I want to talk about today I, I have to go back and address some of the things from from that the first has to do with the mythical 100, 200, 800 thousand mile per gallon carburetor. Lots of you, there were, there were probably a hundred people in the comments. My cousin's neighbor's son's brother knew the guy and he got knocked off by big oil and the patents are here and the patents. Listen, you can patent anything. It doesn't mean that it works. But that's besides the point. If you actually follow up and you read through the stories about these guys that big oil knocked off, there's so many holes in the stories. There's so many like um, un, you know, uh, unrealistic things, sequences of events that could have happened. It didn't happen. There is no such thing. Yes, there were probably patents sitting around for carburetors they'll burn all sorts of things and get all sorts of crazy mileage but it doesn't mean that they actually worked here's what you have to realize about this right now and for the last hundred years all around the world places that are even isolated insulated from the the reaches of big oil and big government there are people who devote their lives to corporation i mean just think about just think about the people who were employed by Holly or Edelbrock or any of the, the race carburetor manufacturers. These people live carburation. They understand all of the effects, all of the thermodynamic things that are happening in the induction system. They get all of this. They know all of this. And they do this stuff every day of their lives. If there was anything even remotely viable, every one of these guys would have their own personal car without, without getting into like patents and stuff like that. Every one of them would have a personal car that got 125 miles to the gallon because, you know, they know the secret. There's really no mystery to carburation. There's no magic pill. There's no, there's no carburation unicorns out there. What can be done with carburation has already been done. And you can only, like, right now, like, like any uh, increases, you're just eking out, like, the tiniest percentage because these things were perfected way before we were even born. But that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> no such thing as 100 mile per gallon carburetor. The other thing was a confusion, and this is what I want to talk about today. The other thing was a misconception, a confusion of the terms atomization and vaporization. And a lot of you guys are under the impression that a carburetor vaporizes gasoline. So you talk about the difference between atomization and vaporization. A carburetor does not vaporize anything. Actually, the atomization that takes place in a carburetor creates a situation that works counter to vaporization. The atomization is just taking the fuel droplets, the fuel, and breaking it into very fine droplets into a mist. Vaporization, on the other hand, is actually turning it into a gas. So, and this is, this is something we look at intake manifolds. Factory production intake manifolds have a heat stove. And I'm not talking about race manifolds or air gaps or anything like that. I'm talking about just a, a conventional, everyday, daily driver type of intake manifold. They all have a heat stove. A carburetor intake manifold has a heat stove underneath the plenum. And the purpose of that is to actually counteract the, the drop in temperature that the fuel goes through as it passes through the booster and becomes atomized. So let's just say, just using round numbers, okay? Let's just say the carburetor is, is at 200 degrees. It's at the, the operating, overall operating temperature in the engine. And so the fuel in the bowls is also at 200 degrees. Now, as the fuel is pulled through the boosters and atomized, that temperature will drop 30, 40, 50 degrees. So now you've got, a, you've got this cloud of atomized fuel underneath the carburetor that's colder than everything else, which is the exact opposite of what you want for a complete efficient burn, a quick, fast lighting, efficient burn. And so that's why underneath every one of these carburetors, you'll find a heat crossover that passes heat underneath the plenum and reheats that fuel after the atomization process and then sends it down the runner to its next step. And this is what I wanted to talk about. 
So vaporization, Smokey's hot vapor engine. The idea was to have all of this vaporization take place in the intake truck before it actually got into the combustion chamber. Because once the mixture is in the combustion chamber, you have a combination of atomized and vaporized fuel. All right. The fuel is atomized. It's on its way down the intake truck. When it hits the intake valve, and the intake valve, the intake valve itself serves more than just one purpose. It wasn't really by design. The intake valve's design is to just let the, the mixture in and then close it off so compression can take place. But it actually serves a second purpose. The intake valve is a heating element. So picture this now. The ambient temperature around the intake is 200 degrees. So the carburetor is 200 degrees. It, the mixture comes through. It heats, it meets the intake manifold. The intake manifold is operating slightly hotter because it has a stove underneath. So it's at maybe 250 degrees or thereabouts. But now this mixture is moving through fast, so it doesn't really have time to grab all of the heat from the radiant heat in the intake manifold. The intake valve, on the other hand, operates once the engine's up to full operating temperature, the intake valve, the back face of the intake valve, actually has several different temperature ranges. The stem is at approximate engine operating temperature. Whatever it's reading on your gauge is approximately what the stem is at. But the back face of the valve right here is operating between five and 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you get to the seat area, and the seat area drops down to between three and 400 degrees because that heat is being wicked away from the cylinder head through the seat. But this actual back face right here is up around 550, 600 degrees, normal, average, typical operating temperature of an engine. And as the intake charge comes down the runner, the intake, the, it stops at the back face of the intake valve, and that's where the the lion's share of atomization or vaporization takes place. So now the intake valve opens. The initial uh, fuel that actually came in contact with the back face of the intake valve is now lightened up and vaporized. But what goes in around it is not lightened up and vaporized. It's atomized. So now inside the combustion chamber, you've got this combination of the light vapors that the spark plug is going to grab and light easily, and you've got the atomized molecules that are that are floating around in there, well not floating around, they're being compressed by the piston. There are several different factors that increase the temperature of the fuel to the point of vaporization happening inside this area. But it starts at the back face of the intake valve. And also the piston, the head of the piston is also up there in the five to six hundred degree range as the engine is running, so as it's up to operating temperature. Now one of the problems you have with older engines, carbureted engines, just older engines in general, is people will, will note a lack of efficiency. The engine becomes less efficient the older it gets. And it's not that it's losing compression. The rings can still be sealing. It can still have a lot of compression. The valves are sealing. The rings are sealing. Everything is good. But efficiency drops off. And one of the big reasons that efficiency drops off is because of the carbon that builds up in these engines. Because now, instead of the fuel mixture, the atomized fuel, hitting the, the hot, even surface of the back of the intake valve and the top of it. Instead of it seeing those things, it's meeting a layer of carbon. And the carbon is actually acting as an insulator. It's not allowing the, the atomized fuel to actually meet the full temperature available at the back of the intake manifold and the head of the piston. Vaporization is super important. And this may be unrelated, but it's not unrelated at the same time. It's just an extreme example of it. And you got to go back to, to nitro, top fuel. So one of the innovations that happened around 1988, 1989, about the time I was getting involved in this stuff deeply, one of the innovations that happened was that Dale Armstrong, he, he was, the guy was a true innovator, a true genius. He understood how nitro worked and then passed it on to the rest of the world. One of the innovations that, that Armstrong came up with was what they called down nozzles. So essentially in a nitro motor, 
fuel is injected above the blower in the hat area, and that fuel is whipped into a, no, let's go back. Nitromethane has about the same qualities as water. You're, you're, to get nitro to atomize, it takes a tremendous amount of heat. It takes a tremendous amount of, 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 of pressure to get it to atomize, much less vaporize. To get it to vaporize, it's difficult, a lot of heat. And so that's why nitro engines are, were, at a point, so completely inefficient. Armstrong's uh, innovation with the down nozzles pretty much allowed these engines to double their output from around 2,500, 3,000 horsepower to around 6,000 horsepower. And it was through these down nozzles. So as I was saying, on a nitro motor, back in the day, you had a row of nozzles at the hat and they would spray fuel down into the blower. And the blower would whip it up and heat it somewhat into a, a, a almost atomized mixture. Then it would hit the intake manifold. The intake manifold is a little bit hotter, and there'd be another set of nozzles down at the port nozzles, and they would inject more fuel directly into the port. So basically, what co what's coming in through the hat is getting mixed around through the blower, whipped around, but it's not in a uniform state. So then you would have a set of nozzles, so here's the intake ports, and you have a set of nozzles in the intake right here, and they would create a uniform mixture that each cylinder could could pull off of. So you could tune through those nozzles. Once they added the second mag and the second pump, they were able to get the fire lit, they were able to light more volume of fuel and get more vol volume of fuel in. But the engines, while performance picked up somewhat, it didn't really go crazy because now when you start pouring that fuel in through the port nozzles, it's puddling, it's wet, it's sloppy, it doesn't want to light. So dropping cylinders was a very common thing. What Armstrong did was he used the radiant heat from the cylinder head and the direct heat from the back face of the valve with a set of down nozzles. So what they did was they added under the valve cover on the cylinder head, they added a fuel, a fuel rail and a set of nozzles that were, that were located right here, right exactly here, a pair of nozzles. And these nozzles would spray, the, so first the fuel comes in, it's heated by the radiant heat from the top of the cylinder head underneath the valve cover, so that brings it up to a few hundred degrees. And then it's being sprayed directly onto the back face of the intake. And so that's the lightest part of the mixture. And it was that fuel that was that was broken up by the but lightened up and broken up by the heat that would allow these engines to light and go like that. And that allowed that was the, the, the step that allowed the next phase. And like I said, essentially doubled the output of those engines in that era. Really amazing stuff. But it all came down to heat and vaporization and, and efficiency. Enough of that. So The vapor, the Smokey's hot vapor engine was attempting to handle all of those elements in the intake tract and not have to deal with all of the varying surface temperatures inside the combustion chamber, rely on those to have a partially vaporized, partially atomized mixture, which is what we essentially deal with with, with internal combustion engines, with gasoline engines. Now on modern engines, and we're talking about carbureted engines because we're, stay, we're staying in the world of classic cars, vintage cars, and talking about efficiency and getting the biggest bang for the buck. Today's technology uses different systems, different, different methodologies to create that vaporized mixture. More vapor, less atomized mixture. A more hom homogeneous uh, filling of the cylinder for more even lighting. So I don't want to even talk about things like direct injection and stuff like that yet. We will at some point. I want to keep it within the realm of what we deal with, you know, the typical street and strip or just daily driver carbureted vintage car engine. So if I had to sum anything up with all of this, in the name of efficiency, in the name of getting the most vaporization in your tract, you want to keep things as clean as possible. You want to keep the back face of your, of your intake valves as carbon-free as possible. There's a lot to decarboning an engine. There's, it's more than just getting carbon out. It's a matter of creating clean surfaces that can perform the functions 
to the best of their ability. So a clean intake valve is going to lighten up and vaporize more of that atomized mixture than one that's like this and it's just coated and insulated with crusty old carbon. That's why you want, it's one of the main reasons why you want to keep carbon out from the inside of your engine. So that's it for this one. <laughs> the next time we're going to talk about bores and how different bore diameters will affect your engine's ability to create, not cubic inches mind you, but bore diameter will affect, have, have a major effect on your engine's ability to generate good gas mileage numbers. That's it. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.